Dr. Michael Hurley, welcome and thank you very much for, for coming along today. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd start off by uh, speaking about sort of maybe just if you could give us an idea of what does English mean to you and, and studying it at the University of Cambridge? Well, there's two questions at Cambridge and, and what does it mean to me? I suppose I've always been fascinated by language as a craft. Um, how do you craft a great sentence? What makes one sentence um, winning and trenchant and incisive and, and another one uh, fall flat? And the same would apply to a sonnet or a play or a you know, triple-decker novel. So I'm interested in the artisanal, the craft, how things work or don't work. Mm. But by extension of that, I'm interested in not merely, as it were, thinking of literature as nuts and bolts, as something inert that is an object which is successful or not, but something that elicits powerful feelings mm. and powerful thoughts. And so it, thinking of literature as not merely that something that gives us pleasure, although that's essential to wh why we are drawn to literature, but something that can excite our imagination so it can provoke in us thoughts and perhaps address some of the most profound and perennial questions of what it is to be a human being, what love is, what truth is, what goodness is. Absolutely, I think that sort of perfectly encapsulates the, the, the benefits of reading. And, um, and on to the second sort of part of that. Uh, yes, Cambridge. so Cambridge um, has a strong tradition of thinking very much about the, um, what, what William Blake would call the minute particulars. So there's a strong tradition of close reading that comes under the rubric of what's called practical criticism mm. in Cambridge. Um, and so thinking about the, the puckerings and pleatings uh, uh, of language is essential to the Cambridge course. But the Cambridge course also has this commitment to breadth. So it's not just about strenuous attention to you know, a, a, a few canonical works, but thinking about the canon as it's developed over time and across different genres. So mm. you emerge from Cambridge with a real sense of um, the, the unfolding story of literature as it's been inflected through the um, Anglophone literature and beyond. So you can also study um, comparative um, across different languages and so on. So the Cambridge course is, I think, uniquely successful in capturing that sense of the, the breadth, this broad tradition and ongoing conversation, but also ha taking these deep soundings to these um, to these, it, these minute particulars that Blake was so interested in, on which he understood, because they're small details, um, nothing less than everything can rest on them. It, it, and, and, and so we develop this kind of microscope and telescope capacity. Fascinating. Um, and so perhaps, though, on the, on the flip side of the, the fascination, is that might be, sound somewhat um, overwhelming, perhaps, for some of our, our, our participants who've just studied their A-levels. And so I wonder, wondered maybe you could sort of elaborate a little bit more on when they first start, what, what does that first, first couple of weeks, first couple of months look like when they arrive at the college? Well, the first thing to say is that the college um, provides you with fellows who supervise you or direct studies for you. So it's not like you arrive and then off you go and mm. see you in three years, you know. Very much the opposite, that you are guided through a course. So the course tries to balance both this obligation and this burden, uh, as you could see it, to, to drag your way through you know, literary history from the medieval period all the way through. But you are liberated with the encouragement and guidance of your the other fellows and the other um, those who direct studies for you, to make choices on what you'll study and you'll check in each week with essays and so on. So mm. there's very much um, a, a sense of a kind of bespoke uh, um, experience of literature. So you'll go to the faculty and you'll have you know large lectures which will speak to whatever period you happen to be working on at the time, or whatever genre you happen to be working on, or whatever um, particular specialism. But then you check in regularly with the fellows of the college and uh, who will supervise you and who will guide you through the course. So it's very much this um, partnership between your own individual interests as you self-propel, mm -hmm. and then the kind of expert um, steering of those who are in your charge. We're particularly lucky at Trinity to have a really rich fellowship that covers all the way from the medieval period to the early modern, all the way up. And also that there's not just that historical breadth, but there's a, a really um, wonderful complementarity of diverse interests. So whatever you're interested in, you can find it at Trinity um, through, this, through this kind of mentoring, guide, guiding system known as the Director of Study system. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, an absolutely crucial part of the Cambridge experience. And perhaps what separates um, Cambridge from lots of the other universities out there is that opportunity to really delve into your particular area of interest that, yeah. that might not be such a possibility elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with that sort of in mind, I, I wonder if, there, if you're a 17 year old sitting at home or um, just thinking about applying in October, what's the best thing they could do between now and, and, and then to, to prepare for the course? Well, I think 
two things. First of all, do as well as you can in your A-levels. Um, not merely as a kind of hoop jumping. It's not merely a, like a warrant to practice. You've done your A-levels, now you can go. The A-levels have a huge inherent value. They, they cultivate a work ethic because it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, but they also lay a foundation, a skill foundation. So do as well as you can, first and foremost, in your A-levels. But then, insofar as we're, what we're looking for in Cambridge is um, uh, aptitude, but also appetite. So it's not merely that you're good at doing something, but you really have a kind of passionate investment that mm -hmm. goes beyond the curriculum. So you don't just merely meet the criteria or whatever's asked of you. But that you, let's say there's an author that you're studying a set text at school, and then maybe you'll read beyond that, um, the same author, uh, 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 other text that, that he or she has written, or perhaps you'll dip into other periods and so on. There's a particular emphasis in our moment on the present. We're rather obsessed with our own moment. Um, it's a kind of cultural problem, I think, and one of the remedies to that problem is to look back across hundreds of years and perhaps in different cultures and see yourself and your culture reflected in different ways and, and it can provoke you to think about your own moment in different ways. So it's that combination really of do what is required of you at school but then try to move beyond mm. and to read broadly. Um, and it's not just a quantitative matter, it's not just um, trying to read as much as you can but to try to think how um, different texts are working with language to engage perhaps the same questions but in different ways and so you notice going back to what I was saying right at the beginning the artisanal question how is it that this writer writes this kind of sentence and this writer with the same as it were resources available same language writes a very different kind of sentence different kind of effects but also how do contexts matter what does it matter that this is in the 18th century or this is written during the civil war mm. and so just those kinds of um, hard thinking while you're reading, so you don't think of reading as just as a kind of holiday from serious thinking. It's not just a story, but it's something which is mediating a complex human experience. Yeah, I think um, you really touched on one of the biggest misconceptions I think we have in, with applications is that they, they think that they can just Google a reading list and then that, a generic reading list, that, and that, that's absolutely not what we're looking no, for. No. And can I just add to that, that there's no expectation you've done your degree before you arrive at Cambridge, so you shouldn't kind of in a mad panic try to know everything and so on. In many ways, you know, sampling different things and try to understand complexity of, of certain kinds of questions rather than trying to solve everything. And if there are particular genres or authors or approaches, critical approaches, scholarly approaches that interest you, really try to invest in those so that you have something that you can say when you come to have a conversation with those who will be interviewing you, which can demonstrate that you really are invested. You're not, as it were, merely rehearsing what your teachers have told you, or indeed merely rehearsing what you've read that other critics or scholars have said, but we can see your own voice emerging. And this is important. It's sometimes asked, what's the difference between A-level English and degree-level English? And one of the questions, uh, one of the ways of answering that uh, difficult question is, of course there's the natural ratcheting up of a standard, you expect more as you go through the educational system, but there is also the liberation, it should feel like a liberation, mm -hmm. to find your own voice. What do you have to say? Which doesn't mean that you fall back into pure subjectivity where you just say, well that's my opinion, <laughs> but rather that you think rigorously about how your opinion can be mediated by evidence. You know, what is it about what you feel that you love about this book or perhaps hate about this book or find intriguing about this poem that you can communicate to me? So thinking about English in these three ways, there's the reading, but then there's the rigorous thinking, but then there's the act of communication and that communication is oral, we're having this kind of back and forth conversation, but also written communication. So all of those skills coming together is really what is to be nurtured at the highest level at degree, mm. uh, degree standard, and particularly in Cambridge, we want to know what you think. Um, and so it's not a matter of, as it were, being um, ventriloquizing what you think is the best thing to say. I'll say one more thing about this because it's really important. I think that some people think that the best way to be as impressive as you can is to, is to fill your writing and, and the way you speak with jargon or a sort of professionalized vocabulary and that is really standing in for good thinking. Good thinking should be one where we can ha hash it out between us and so there's a kind of honesty and integrity to what you mm. say and it's not merely a kind of flat rehearsal of what other people have said. I think that's excellent advice. Um, it's that sort of intellectual bravery we might call it um, and not being afraid also to, to make mistakes I think you know. And yeah, and I, I love the word bravery and courage in that context, actually, because rather than thinking that there's a right or wrong answer that, and you don't want to stray beyond that, that precisely what the degree is asking for you is to break cover and to, uh, and to say what you think. And your hunch, you may not be able to substantiate it entirely, but one of the things that happens within the so-called supervision system, which is when you meet 
one-to-one -one or in pairs or in small groups is you'll have an hour or more of back and forth where we're trying to work out what we mean together. So you have a starting position which is an intuition about something that you like it or loathe it or find it uncanny or whatever it might be and we work out, again it's that relationship between the artisan or the craft, how something's been made verbally speaking but also what it's mediating, what kinds of thoughts and sentiments are going on there. And it's very unlikely that off the bat you will have a very cogent and closed idea of, uh, of what it is, but rather the back and forth, the conversation which requires you to be vulnerable, because you might be wrong, or you might be partly wrong, but we might learn from each other in that back and forth. Yeah, yeah, that, that element of it's a two-way conversation is, is vital. Um, in terms of sort of practicalities, perhaps, you know, on a sort of weekly basis, what can students expect in terms of sort of reading load and, and essay writing? So there's, there's two parts to your education, broadly speaking. There's the faculty, and the faculty would take care of large lecture halls and where you, you know, there may be another hundred people there and so on, and there's a, the faculty will have seminars and so on. And that's all um, uh, taken care of at a kind of centralised basis. But within the college itself, you will meet... Um, uh, and be writing one, two, sometimes three essays a week. Um, uh, two is kind of more normal, and you'll be meeting your supervisors twice a week, maybe. Um, uh, uh, and you'll be expected to read a lot. So again, goes back to the, the question of it's not a matter of mere aptitude. If you don't have the appetite, if you don't really thrill to reading and reading new things, not just the things that you like or think you like. There are a lot of students who will say, well, I never thought I would thrill to the medieval. Well, they've never read the medieval yeah, yeah. stuff quite reasonably. And then they come away and think, well, this is, this is my passion, or I never thought you know, 18th century fiction would be for me. And so it really treating it like a kind of adventure where you're set off by your supervisor and you spend a lot of time in libraries. I mean, Trinity, in terms of resources, you know, has the largest college library of, 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 of you know, over 300,000 volumes and so on. So everything is there for you. There's no excuse. <laughs> um, so you can just really, um, if, if the subject is one that thrills you, um, then it's one where you'll get lost week to week, as it were, in imaginative worlds and, and you're writing. And an important part of your education here is not just merely reading and having an opinion, but articulating it verbally, um, speaking back, which is what we're doing, but also through essays. So one or two essays a week in which your supervisors will help you very much refine your, your writing skills. How do you shape an essay? How do you shape a paragraph? How do you shape a sentence? Where shaping is not just about lucidity, or that's really important, how clear can you be, but also how compelling can you be? How can you nuance your information so you don't just trade in binary pieces of information? This is proven or it's not proven. Immanuel Kant, the sort of famous ger German philosopher, spoke very powerfully, said that you know, there's no science of the beautiful. So we're not dealing in ones and zeros, but neither are we dealing in pure subjectivity. So we're trying to work in this kind of middle ground. So you're week to week, you're trying to uh, negotiate that middle ground in what you read and what you think, and then ultimately in what you write, and then your supervisors will give you strong, robust feedback, helpful feedback on how to write better, think better, and ultimately read better. And that's the feedback loop that goes through each week for three years. Brilliant, yeah, and, I, and the amount of transferable skills you come out with as a result of that um, is immense. So I wonder, you know, on that note, um, maybe perhaps people think, people are sitting there thinking, you study English at Trinity and you go on and become a novelist. And so, you know, yeah. is that true? And, and if not, what else, what other careers might, might be possible? Well, it's, it, it, it is true. And people go on to be wonderful novelists. And one of the wonderful things about being at someone like Trinity is you, you're the latest link in the chain of an extraordinary kind of literary pedigree going all the way back. You know, think about Andrew Marvell or George Herbert up to you know, Lord Byron and, uh, and, and Alfred Tennyson and Nabokov and so on. So there is a a long and ongoing tradition of great creativity that comes out of um, uh, the kinds of uh, reading and thinking uh, that goes on in someone like Trinity. So yes, you do produce creative artists and dramatists and so on, but also journalists, uh, also teachers, also politicians, the civil service. If, if we think that the study of literature is um, in, in this kind of trinity of virtues that we're describing, and how do you read well, how do you think well, and how do you communicate well, that sets you up for more or less anything, you know, you're not going to be a vet at the end of it unless you've retrained. <laughs> but you, you yeah. can, you know, in terms of negotiating this world, and in a way, it's never been more pressing. Think about fake news. Think about, um, you know, all the social media deluge of information. How do you negotiate that? And one of the, the core skills that I defined, the signature skill of Cambridge of close reading. I mean, this is an essential key to unlock the truth in a world which is a, in this kind of dizzying mass of uh, uh, of information. So. 
Mm. You're extremely well placed, is what, is, is what I'm saying in a roundabout way, T to do almost anything that's to do with being a human being in respect of language, which is more or less anything. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. And so it's a wonderful diversity. In fact, when the students come back, it's, it's, it's a lovely thing to see. You know, there's a, there's a lawyer, and then there's a politician, and there's a civil servant, and then, you know, uh, um, it, it's a really rich array. Perhaps finally, what, 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 what would you say is the best thing about studying English at Trinity? Well, I suppose I'd come back to the sense that from the moment that you arrive, you're, you're folded into an extraordinary community. So we, it's one of the highest um, intakes, is 10 a year is an average. So you've really got a, a, a good critical mass of students, 10 each year, so that'd be 30 in total. But then you also have graduates, high level of graduates, and postdoctoral students, junior research mm -hmm. fellows as they're called. And then this uh, a, a high number of fellows, but also we have writers in residence who are feeding into the culture and then some emeritus fellows, of retired fellows and senior research fellows and so on. So you get this very um, rich community of common endeavor. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And that then enables and generates things like reading retreats and trips to um, Stratford-upon-Avon to listen to Shakespeare, going to galleries, all that sort of thing, because it's all part of a kind of general um, intellectual ferment and, and development. So both in terms of the resources which are material, like the great libraries and the manuscripts. I, mean, I haven't even mentioned that, you know, it's a wonderful thing teaching Tennyson, the uh, poet laureate of the late 19th century for, for many decades. You, you can go to the libraries here and look at the manuscripts, see, as it were, the creative process. Uh, um, you can look behind the curtain, as it were, and see how the, 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 the craftsmen at work. Um, and it's an astonishing, humbling thing. There's Shakespeare first folios, there's um, you know, uh, uh, John Milton's um, Lycidas, you can look at it. And so there is nowhere, uh, I, I think, that quite has this uh, combination of a kind of um, historical tradition in terms of the, the, the writers who've been here, which you're the latest you know, inheritor, but also the, c the current moment of, um, of, of a kind of living tradition of which you are become the immediate inheritor. So I think it's extremely exciting. And um, you are aided and uh, abetted by a very committed fellowship who, who, who only want the, the best for you in terms of uh, pushing you hard, that, that you can uh, manage those, the, those three complementary skills that I mentioned earlier of, of, of reading, thinking uh, and writing. Well, if that's not an inspiring way, uh, way to end, then I don't know what is. So, um, Professor Michael Hurley, thank you very much. Thank you.